Morning. Morning, everybody. It's fantastic to see you all uh, here for what promises to be uh, a great day. Um, a day when we've got the chance to do something that can make a, a, real, a real difference. Um, welcome to Greater Manchester's Green Summit. We've, uh, as a city region, we've spent a long time when we were, uh, we were dominated by red. More recently, we've been a blue city, but today we're going to be a green city. Put all that behind you, up to one side. Not just for one day, of course, though, uh, but, uh, but for the rest of this century. That is, uh, that is the plan. That's why we've, uh, we've brought, uh, brought you all together. The aim is to see if we can set out a new uh, vision for Greater Manchester as the country's first zero-carbon uh, city region. That's what we're uh, trying to do uh, today. Uh, but in true Greater Manchester tradition, we want to do it differently. So this just isn't the usual same old conference where somebody like me arrives in a suit and reels off a speech and says to you, well, here's all these things that we're going to do because we've decided them in a closed room and we didn't tell you about them, but we're now announcing them to you. Generally, that's how <coughs> things work. You'll have been to, to conferences like that before. Uh, this one isn't going to work like that. This one is going to be, uh, be very, very different. Um, I'm going to put to you my ambition as mayor, the recommendation I'm making uh, to uh, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, our public bodies, but actually everybody in Greater Manchester. But then I want you to test that, to challenge that, to debate how we're going to make that, to challenge yourselves, uh, to make this a, a really a true conversation today about how we accelerate uh, the, the whole agenda around, around climate change. Uh, that is what this, uh, this event uh, is, is all about. You're going to hear from some, some amazing speakers uh, in the course of today. Uh, you're going, hopefully, to be inspired uh, by what they've uh, got to say. But at the end of the day, this is about all of us. What are we all uh, going to commit uh, to make uh, the change uh, that, we, that we need, uh, need to make? Uh, and that's what, um, that's what you're here to do. You're here, I have to say, you're here to work, uh, not to just listen. Uh, it's got to be about everybody uh, playing their part in uh, what, we're, what we're trying uh, to achieve. I just want to say something about where this event came from, where the idea of the Green Summit came from. It actually was uh, conceived about a year ago during the mayoral uh, election campaign. I can see in the audience today some people who were at some of those mayoral hustings events where the candidates were being uh, challenged. At one of those events, a whole group of people said to me, the UK and Greater Manchester are on a pathway at the moment to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's too late. It's too slow. If we follow that, the, the damage to the planet will be irreversible. There'll be rising temperature that we won't be able to, uh, to, to, um, to reverse. So you, need, you should all be thinking differently about it. And what, what are you going, uh, going to do? So, to be honest, that, that stuck with me, um, and I've been thinking about that uh, ever since. But what, what's come through to me more and more uh, as I've been in the role of mayor for the 10 months that, that I've been in the job, cities like ours, former industrial uh, cities, need to embrace two big forces for change, in my view, digitalization and decarbonization. For me, that's the future. You know, it is partly about thinking about the digital and tech sector within this city and the low carbon uh, sector. They're very important in terms of sources and jobs and prosperity. But actually, in the rest of this century, all businesses are going to have to be both digital businesses and green businesses. And the quicker we embrace that, I think the more we will be putting ourselves in a leadership position and setting ourselves up uh, for, uh, for the future. So that's where the thinking about this event uh, came from. Through devolution, through the power that we've been given, that the leaders of Greater Manchester asked the government for, can we do something different? Can we break off that path that the UK is on to carbon neutrality by 2050 and, and set a new date, a bigger ambition? And that's what I'm asking you all today, whether or not we should 
uh, we should do that. What I would say is, <clears throat> it's very much in keeping with the history of, of Greater Manchester. If you look back into the past, we have been simultaneously an industrial innovator and a social disruptor at the same time, often bringing forward uh, new discoveries, new industries, but at the same time thinking about how they can be aligned with making social and human progress at the same time. That has often been the way this city has worked uh, in the past. And if you think back to two uh, centuries ago, even more, when this place was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, those debates were taking place then. How do we uh, bring forward new technology into the mills, into the workplaces that will uh, improve them, make them safer, improve people's quality of living, uh, and at the same time make sure uh, that, we, that we raise uh, living standards for, for everybody here. Those, this is what Manchester has always, always done. But here's the difference, I would say. If you look back to the Industrial Revolution, while it may have helped improve people's uh, working conditions, perhaps their wages, it took away their green spaces. It gave them filthy air to breathe. That's what happened in places uh, like this all those uh, years ago. And the question is, can we develop a 21st century revolution where we also give people better jobs, as they did back then, but at the same time, by giving people those better jobs, also give them cleaner air to breathe and better green spaces to live in. That is the 21st century uh, challenge. And I think it's a challenge that Greater Manchester is absolutely uh, well-placed uh, to lead. One of, I want to read to you one of my favourite quotes um, about, uh, about uh, Manchester. No pr prizes for guessing who, who said it, but uh, here it is. In Manchester, it rains and rains, and yet we manage to produce the Industrial Revolution, the Trade Union Movement, the Communist Manifesto, and even the goddamn computer. Down south, where the sun never sets, you took all of our money, and what did you produce? Chaz and Dave. <laughs> Somebody in a position of power should build a statue to Tony Wilson somewhere in this city. I, I'm absolutely certain about, uh, about that. But it actually it raises, actually, that quote, quite a, a, pertinent, uh, a pertinent point. So let me just get this straight. We've managed to develop solutions to produce renewable energy from the sun. We've managed to bring technology forward to produce renewable energy from the wind. Tell me, one of you, please, in this audience today, when is somebody going to bring forward a solution to make renewable energy from rainfall? <laughs> because when you do, Manchester will sweep all before it and take over uh, the world. And I'm just waiting for one of you uh, to, give me, uh, to give me that, uh, uh, that plan. Um, it is, though, it, it is much more, isn't it, than basically just doing what's right uh, by, uh, by the planet. The serious point that I'm setting out today is asking people to stop seeing the environmental agenda as a cost and a burden agenda. I think this is a barrier that we've got to get over. You know, already in the media interviews I've done today, people are saying, can you afford it? Can it be uh, achievable in times when... Uh, when times, uh, times are, are tough. And my answer to that is, at some point in this century, in the 21st century, all, all homes will be zero carbon at some point. At some point in this century, all buildings of any kind will be zero carbon, public or private uh, buildings. At some point, all cars will be zero carbon, all public transport will be zero carbon. I don't think anybody here today would seriously uh, debate whether or not those things will happen. The question is when. The question is when. And surely the area, the places that embrace those things first 
are putting themselves in a position of economic strength when it comes uh, to facing up uh, to the future. So rather than seeing the whole agenda as a burden, we've got to see it for the benefits uh, that it can bring. There may be a greater upfront cost in a zero carbon home, but let's stop thinking as we tend to do in Britain of the short term, a short termist approach to life. Surely let's start talking to the public about the lifetime cost of the homes that we're building, how much it costs to, to heat them and to run them. And the same with transport. As I'm looking at reforming the bus system here in Greater Manchester with the new powers that I have given to me by Parliament, I need to look at the lifetime cost of running buses. So it may cost more at the moment to buy an electric bus, but actually look at the cost of that throughout the whole lifespan of public transport, because it actually may be cheaper when you don't have to put the fuel in uh, to, run, to run the bus. So we've got to move this debate away from a, a burden agenda, a cost agenda, to see it for the huge, uh, the huge benefits uh, that, it, that it might uh, bring. And that's the spirit in which I, uh, today, am putting this, um, this whole debate uh, to you. And I'm going to start then with my first proposal uh, today in terms of what I am saying, what I am recommending to all of you as Mayor of Greater Manchester. My proposal, and the proposal I want to place at the heart of this summit today, is whether, as I say, we should break off this path towards carbon neutrality by 2050. We've had research commissioned uh, by uh, the Tyndall Centre, and you'll be hearing more uh, from people associated with the Tyndall Centre uh, today. They've said that quite clearly that is too late. That if Greater Manchester truly wants to fulfil its commitments under the, the Paris Agreement and be the global citizen that we all, we all think of, of Manchester as, then we've got to come much further forward. And they've suggested 2038. So my first proposal to you today is, should we set a new date? I'm proposing that we bring the current date forward by at least a decade at least a decade to 2040. But in saying that, it's really important for me to say at the beginning of today that this can't be the public sector alone setting new targets for itself. Because if we think about it in that way, then we're getting off on completely the wrong foot. If we're going to do that, if we're going to set that new date, it's got to be everybody together, public sector, private sector, community and voluntary sector, faith sector, all sectors of society saying we are on this journey together. It's about everybody challenging what they do, individuals and organisations, and being prepared uh, to, make, uh, to make change. So that is the proposal that I'm, uh, I'm making. And the first question, if you like, for this summit to, um, to debate is, do you agree? Should we accelerate uh, that, uh, that date. And if you think we should, then what should that date be and what would we need to do to put ourselves on a, on a path uh, towards uh, achieving it? And the reality is if we do sign up, it means making change quickly, beginning to make real change uh, now. So I want to hear from you on that, that whole question uh, today. And we need to debate the implications. What does it mean? What does it mean for ordinary people, what does it mean uh, for families, what does it mean for businesses, uh, and then see if we can develop a consensus throughout the course of today around what we're proposing uh, to do. I'm hoping that you will agree, um, and I also know, I'm not deflecting from the public sector, I also know there are things that, that we have to start doing now if we're to, uh, to, to provide the, the momentum uh, towards that uh, new day. So, the questions that we'll be posing to you today. On energy, should we be thinking about a GM energy company that is capable of investing in the production of re renewable energy, the storage of renewable energy, the optimization of the use of that uh, energy? You know, should we be seriously thinking about that as a combined authority? Am I right in thinking that you want fracking to pay, play no part in energy in Greater Manchester? I see a, a few nods. I'm, I feel the first question of the day has probably been answered. I um, thought you might 
say that. But let's be clear, let's work through these issues and let's get a clear agenda together. And that's what, as I say, today uh, is about. On buildings, so here's a, another specific. And again, Councillor Alex Gnotis and I, um, Alex sitting right behind me here, who leads on uh, green issues uh, for uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, leader of Stockport Council. As we're developing the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, which many of you will be very familiar with, should we set a date in that framework, a date whereby all homes built in Greater Manchester, new homes, are zero carbon? Because at some point, we have to stop adding to this problem. So again, if you agree with that as a policy proposal, uh, you need to tell us, but you also need to tell us what that date should probably uh, be. Should we be thinking about a major scheme to retrofit our existing uh, domestic properties and homes? A lot of these, we're making progress. A lot of these questions are beginning to be answered. So the question then is how? If we think we should, the question is how. On transport, do you want me to use our new powers to work towards an emissions-free uh, public uh, bus system alongside Metrolink, which already uh, is powered by renewable energy? Should we be looking uh, for something similar? with regard uh, to the bus uh, system. Over the course of today, and there are many more issues that will be in your minds, Alex and I want to hear feedback on all of these issues, on energy, on buildings, on green spaces and the natural environment, uh, to then take them back and start answering the questions that I'm just posing to you today. There is one that I've decided on, though, that is definitely going to, to happen. We're very lucky in Greater Manchester to have Chris Boardman uh, who is acting as our uh, cycling and walking commissioner uh, for Greater Manchester. I, I think, from any perspective, cycling is something that we need to be investing in right now because of the returns to people's health, uh, the, the benefits in terms of air quality, uh, the beneficial effect on uh, congestion. It just makes sense on, on every level. So what I can confirm to you today is that after a, an initial budget next year to get him going, Chris and his team will have £50 million a year behind them uh, from 2019-20 for three years at least uh, to get uh, cycling infrastructure built across Greater Manchester. So we're very open today to being challenged. You know, that's why we are here. We're going to listen to you. We're ready to be challenged about all of this uh, ambitious agenda that I'm beginning uh, to lay out to you. I, I would say to you, you need to think about how it is for us, because obviously times are tough and there's a limit to what, what we can do. So put yourself in our shoes, if you will, to think about what's also realistic. Because uh, the more realistic you can make those challenges, the more we will be able to do something uh, with them. But today's not just, I said it was a day with a difference, and I mean it, it's not just a day for you to challenge us. It's a day for us to challenge you as well and for you to challenge yourselves. You know, what I want to do by the end of today is bring people up onto this stage to make commitments on behalf of themselves or their organisations, to make pledges about the change already that you're going to make to put this momentum behind Greater Manchester's journey towards becoming the first truly uh, zero carbon green city uh, in, in the UK. And the more that you do that, the more that we will put energy and momentum into this whole, whole initiative. I, I hope later today that you're going to hear about a new city region-wide campaign to drive down use of single-use plastics. Um, I don't, it's not for us necessarily to dictate that. It should be industry-led. We will support it. But I hope you know, we're going to get people coming forward to support that campaign uh, later today. But that's the spirit in which we're, we're doing this. We want people to, to come forward and make, uh, make pledges as part of, of what we're doing today, to get that momentum in what we're uh, trying to do. Because I want to come out of this event today with Greater Manchester ahead of the rest, doing what we've always done best in our history, a leader, a leader in terms of what's right, what's right for us individually, what's right for us uh, collectively driving change from the bottom up. That's what we've done in our history. And this year, we're celebrating 100 years of women having the right to vote, 150 years of the trade union movement, movements which both grew out of this, of this great city. You know, this city has 
challenge the status quo and change the world before. There's absolutely no reason at all why we can't do so again. I think in the 21st century, change is more likely to come through the cities, the cities that are bold, that have a big vision. I want Greater Manchester to be part of that club around the world of the most forward-thinking cities when it comes to the zero carbon uh, agenda. That's where we should be. That's where we've always been in terms of an industrial and social uh, pioneer. We've led the industrial revolution in our past. Today, we should all commit uh, to lead the green revolution going forward. Thanks very much, everybody, for being here. Have a wonderful day. And I now uh, want to uh, introduce uh, to you our first uh, speaker uh, today. I want to um, uh, give the stage, uh, and I want you all to give a, a very warm welcome to uh, Professor Kevin Anderson. Kevin holds uh, a professorship at Uppsala University uh, in, in Sweden, but also is a Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre at the uh, University of, of Manchester, uh, a, a towering figure uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to the Green Agenda. So a warm welcome uh, to Kevin Anderson. Okay, can you all hear me well with this microphone? Okay, good, excellent. Um, well, I've called this talk here, um, Manchester, Paris, two degrees centigrade, laggard or leader? And after what we've just heard from Andy there, hopefully it's going to be much more the latter than the former. Um, so, you can get this to work. Um, th and this presentation builds on some work that we've been doing within the Tyndall Centre here in Manchester with uh, three colleagues, um, Dr. Jay's Curricos, Dr. Kylie McLaughlin, who's also the director of the Tyndall Centre at the University of Manchester, and John Broderick. And if you've got any particularly difficult questions, the first two of those are here today and are sat down at the front. So, uh, challenging questions, please um, ask them of, Anne, of Jay's and Carly. I'm going to start off with um, a quote that I recently got off Alex Stephan. Um, and that is, this is my concluding quote. And it reads like this, because winning slowly is basically the same thing as losing outright. In the face of both triumphant denialism and predatory delay, trying to achieve climate action by doing the same thing, the same old ways, means defeat. It guarantees defeat. And so far, I would argue, the 20th century, and indeed the beginning of the 21st century, has been very much along the lines of defeat on climate change. Does this seem to work? Right. Um, the next uh, uh, two, two pictures I've got here, actually, are, I think, set in the context for what I want to talk about, and, and I think reframes the agenda. People of my age, um, born in 1962, will remember this. this. When I was born, there were no pictures of the Earth. This was taken in 1972, the last, the last time humans actually saw the Earth as a whole, because we've not been back out that far in space since um, without probes. This is the, the, uh, the blue marble, as it was called, and it, already I can feel the hairs in the back of my neck standing up. It, it, it changed my way of looking at the world, this little blue marble where we have, have the privilege to live in this dark, bleak back, backdrop. And then a few years later, in fact, this is the Voyager probe that was launched in 74, but actually by 94 was six billion kilometers away, looking back at Earth. And this is Carl Sagan's pale blue dot. And I think it just reminds us when we're, you know, we live in our day-to-day -day world, that actually the world around us, the, or the universe around us, is a very dark, bleak place. And we really have nowhere else to go but where we live today. So protecting our own home is important. And to me, this, is re this changed my way of thinking about um, our role within the wonders of our planet. Despite the fact that these, were, uh, these pictures were out towards the latter part of the 20th century, I would argue that we are still locked into 19th and 20th century uh, mindsets when trying to solve 21st century system level wicked issues of which climate change is just but one. Um, we have a, an economics which is simply not fit for purpose. We have a naive belief in technical utopias and as an engineer, I particularly like technology, but not utopias. Um, and yet we're still deeply embedded in yesterday's technologies. We think because we've got a clicker or because we've got a laptop or a mo mobile phone that we're actually in the modern world. Remember, they're still powered by, by Charles Parsons' 1890 steam turbine or Whittle's 1936 jet engine. And we still go home to live in our red brick terraces. So we're still locked in to infrastructure that is 100 or more years old. And we also think that what we don't do today we can resolve and solve tomorrow, which completely misunderstands the fundamental science of climate change. So it brings the agenda down to what do we do today? We have to think differently. 
And I would argue so far that we have really failed to think differently. So I'm going to look at that in a little bit more detail now. But there is a real message of hope here from the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2015, less so from the bond climate negotiations this year. But I think the Paris Agreement did establish sort of an unprecedented international agenda, a covenant, if you like, um, which has committed, and remember it's committed us, it's not a target, it's committed us to take action to hold global average temperature rise to no more than two degrees centigrade. And let's also be clear that a two degrees centigrade of warming, which doesn't sound too challenging on a cold day in Manchester, but that will also mean that many people around the world will die at two degrees C of warming. They'll be poor, they'll be a long way from here, there'll be very low emitters that have not caused the problem, typically be non-white. So we know that, and that, that's why that particular group argues strongly for one and a half degrees C of warming in Paris. We're, we're supposed to do this in accordance with the best science, and also on the basis of equity, and no country in the world has taken any notice of that so far, including the UK with its Climate Change Act and the Committee on Climate Change. Every country so far has ignored the equity dimension of this. To whom are these commitments made? Remember, commitments, not targets or aspirations. They're made to the poor and the climate vulnerable who are suffering today because we've got the lights on in here and we're burning coal power to actually generate the power for these lights. So these people are suffering today. And let's also be clear that Manchester has this wonderfully rich diaspora and the families of those diaspora are often suffering at the forefront of climate change that we have knowingly imposed upon them. So you know, these Mancunians have families elsewhere in the world that are suffering. Do we really care about our own children? Do we want to think about their prospects in the future? It's to them that we've made this commitment. To other species, to other ecosystems, we've made this commitment. But also, I think, to our own unique home, the wonderful place that we live on this wonderful blue planet. So what so far has been our response to change? I always think it's important to, to take away the veil, the facade, and to actually look bluntly at what have we done so far. Well, let's have a bit of humility as a starting point. The first report from the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change to collect the data on the science came out in 1990, and some of you here clearly weren't born there. So for 28 years, we've known what to do on climate change. Yet in 2016, our emissions were 60% higher than they were in 1990. In 2017, the emissions still went up by about 1.5%. So 28 years, despite all the, the optimistic rhetoric, 28 years of abject failure on climate change by people with no hair, dyed hair or grey hair. So we have actively been handing this on to the next generation. And there have been a whole litany of scams or frauds that have allowed us to get to this position. We had offsetting, paying the poor to diet for us. We had the clean development mechanism, which was just state-sanctioned offsetting. We've now got the emissions trading scheme with so many permits issued that the price of carbon has been made basically zero. Aforestation, plant a tree, expand an airport. And when all of this this, uh, these facades fail, we're now going to be relying, already in the UK we're relying on this, on speculative negative emission technologies to suck the CO2 out of the air. And with that vine finally um, um, chicken comes home to roost, um, then uh, we're going to have to rely on geoengineering, firing rockets into the stratosphere to spread sulfates out to reflect sunlight into space. That's what we're relying on so far. In 28 years, we have not tried to cut our CO2. Every scam, but cut our CO2. And just look at our own country here. And this is one of the most progressive, the industrialized countries on climate change. But just look what happens here. We have the Climate Change Act, still world leading legislation. This is an excellent act in 2008. We've got the semi independent Committee on Climate Change. We've had significant growth in renewables and improved energy efficiency. We've had the biggest global recession, which is good for climate change, but not very good for the rest of us, um, since in the 1930s and the biggest um, in the UK since 1945. And yet, that, despite that, the UK remains a very high carbon society. When you take away all of this, the little sort of accounting techniques we use to make it look like we're doing well, we've seen virtually no change in carbon emissions in the UK since 1990 when you factor in aviation, shipping, imports and exports, which almost always conveniently ignored in the accounting um, that government reports on. So um, where do we go from here? Because it's quite a challenging position to start from. Well, I think the, the take home issues are first, the Paris Agreement is far more challenging then our policymakers and indeed many of our scientists admit in front of a microphone. Long-term targets have no scientific basis in isolation. The thing that matters is carbon budgets. The carbon we put in the atmosphere builds up year on year and will be there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, changing the climate. Real mitigation for two degrees centigrade of warming, which as I said before is still dangerous, is possible just. 
that this demands what I've called here the holy trinity of cogency, integrity, and courage. And I'm going to go through each one of those briefly now. Cogency. And what does the science tell us about climate change? Well, to, to understand about two degrees centigrade of warming, we need to understand the science and the maths. But you'll be pleased to know, I normally go through all this, I'm not going to today. So, instead, I'm, I'm making the argument because we're up north, it's all about pies. And, and I've been told that what I've got here is not a pie, it's a treacle tart, so that's a bit of a failing. Anyway, um, we have a set... <laughs> I, could, I couldn't find on the, on the internet a decent chorley, a chorley pie. <laughs> um, um, we have a set global pie, or uh, I'm careful using the language, a global tart, um, <laughs> and we have the, uh, which, ca which captures the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit around the globe across the century, on forever. And we have to split that e equitably amongst all of the countries of the world. So every country of the world gets a small part of that pie. And we ask the question then, this is what we've done with my colleagues in the Tyndall Centre, um, well, what's a fair slice for the UK? So there's a, a UK, an old blighty slice. Actually, that's far too big, but that's the only picture I can get on the internet. So there's a slice for the UK. And then we have to ask of that budget, um, how much should Greater Manchester combined authorities get? What's the size of the slice there? So we get a small sliver for Manchester. And we have made an, um, an attempt within the Tunnel Centre to quantify this, to say what does it look like? So we have this bit of pie for G GMCA. And that, this method pie, this is our carbon emissions, are not just for this year, but from this year on forever. So whatever we today, we can't use tomorrow. And if, for those of you who like the numbers, it's about 71 million tonnes of CO2. There or thereabouts, with a bit of a range. That probably means not very much to most of you. But at current levels of emissions um, from, from GMCA, we'll use all of that up in five to six years. So if we don't do anything dramatic today, in five to six years, there'll be no pie left for us from a carbon perspective. We will have failed on two degrees centigrade. So the second part is integrity. What is and is not included in our small slice of the pie? Well, firstly, it includes the usual things, um, heating, electricity use, passenger transport, freight, um, and industry and agriculture and so forth. So they're all factored in there, but there are quite a number of things that are excluded. Um, firstly, it excludes CO2 related to imports, so those from the rest of the world, and indeed those from other parts of the UK. But overall, if every part of the world did this, this works out fine, so that's not a problem. It also ex excludes um, emissions from aviation, and international aviation, and also international shipping. But let's also be clear this, we've factored this into our thinking quite carefully, that if UK aviation and shipping fails to deliver on its commitments for two degrees centigrade, then the Manchester budget gets smaller. In other words, the citizens and the sectors of Manchester will have to compensate for whatever failings that the aviation and the shipping sector have in terms of delivering on their fair contribution to two degrees centigrade of warming. So we have a very strong watching brief we must have um, over those sectors. Now the courage part, what do we need to do? And Andy's already laid out some of that already, so at least we're, we're, we're on the same page here. Um, I would argue to keep it simple here, that there are three headline issues for two degrees centigrade. The first of these, little blocks appearing here anyway, the first of these is that, imagine just taking the top 10% of global emitters and asking them to reduce their average, their carbon footprint to that of the average European. Is that too challenging? That's a one third cut in global CO2. Now my guess is that degree of inequity and in who's responsible holds in this room here. So look at the people next to you, they're the high emitters. And it probably holds for the whole of Manchester region as well, the GMCA region, that most of the emissions come from a small percentage of the population. We require that, that some, some people in that, in that small percentage to be really vociferous, engaged citizens and institutions, our universities, our hospitals and so forth. They need to lead by example and catalyse wider system change that drives regulation. They need to lend support to courageous um, policies being put forward by, uh, by sorry, and innovative policies put forward by our policymakers. But we know who's in this 10%. If we think about who's in that 10% that needs to at least initially catalyze this change, well, it's academics, and we've got plenty of those in the Manchester region. So academics are almost without exception in that group as they spend half their life around the world, traveling around the world on planes, telling little people to reduce their CO2 emissions. <laughs> but don't laugh if you're a policymaker, because <laughs> you're in there as well. <laughs> and don't laugh if in the audience. Audience for climate change events are almost always in the top 10%, if not 1% of global emitters. And if you get in a plane more than once or twice a year, you're in there as well. So students, that's you too. So basically people like us. 
Um, the, the second part of this trilogy here um, is we need very, very tight uh, improvements on efficiency standards. So we need to tighten these every single year, and you'll hear the financial directors will squeal, but the engineers will just deliver within the, within the laws of physics. So don't listen to the financial, never listen to the financial directors. Um, this will provide a long-term market signal that you know, the industries require about what needs to be delivered. And I would argue if wealthy nations both do the efficiency side and those of us who are the high emitters start to make some change, then we can actually drive down energy demand by 40 to 70% in wealthy parts of the world within 10 to 15 years. That means a massive reduction in carbon emissions if we really do think climate change is an important issue. We can deliver on this. It's our choice. The third part, of course, which is absolutely essential, is we have to have low carbon energy supply, but that will take longer to put in place. Hence, we have to make the behavioral changes early on. So we've got a whole suite of things here, geothermal, wind, nuclear, hydro, solar, and so forth. These are all very low carbon, five to 15 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. But remember, electricity is just 20% of the energy we consume. 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity at the moment. So we need a huge electrification program, probably to increase the size of our grid by three to five times in the next 20 years or so. Very challenging. This is a complete retooling of our society's capacity, away from making Lamborghinis and Land Rovers to making wind turbine blades and trams. And if we're serious about climate change, it is that sort of Marshall-style transition we're talking about. So what does this look like for GMCA? This is just some sort of points I'm going to touch on here, and Andy, in fact, has already touched on these. We've got a massive retrofit agenda. All the houses that, are going to be, that will be here in 2050 need to be retrofitted. So the red brick terraces that many of us live in. We need, um, I know there are discussions about whether you should have a congestion zone and all that, so I've called it here a healthy air zone. So you can think of that however you want. We need to make sure that the air in our city is fit for our children to breathe, because you know, that improves the quality of their life, let alone our own. We need to make sure that from today, the only buildings we build are passive house if not better. So our no energy, no, they should have no energy consumption. Because remember, every house with energy consumption locks in the future to have to produce that energy. We need to have charging points for our bicycles and our cars that might be electric. And indeed here, these are the French cars that are also rented, which is another business model we could consider. We need to reduce our flying. There's no need for many of us to fly as often as we do. And we need to never be using business and first class because they are much higher emissions, whether that's in the train or whether that's on the, on the plane. They simply should not be used. They are very high emission sectors. We also need real world-leading virtual communication, which we do not have yet. It's still pretty much in the dark ages compared to the fact we have jet engines transporting us around the world. If we spent that much money on virtual communication, we'd be having a wonderful system today. And of course, we need lots and lots of low carbon or zero carbon, ideally, energy supply. There are major long-term benefits from this. Improved air quality, increased life expectancy, reduced health costs, eliminated fuel poverty, long-term sustainable jobs agenda, which I think is really important when we can sell that on politically, a lesser inequitable society. I think hopefully most of us would think that's good. National, international leadership, and all with much lower carbon. So we can, we, this is a, this is a win, there are many win-win opportunities here, but this is not going to be easy. The mitigation agenda is without precedent. There are no historical precedents for what we're doing today. Whether it's acid rain, ozone, or even the plastics one, nothing compares with the scale of the challenge we're facing here. There are no exempt sectors or individuals. There are no meaningful trade-offs. We have to make the changes ourselves. Full decarbonisation of GCM, GMCA needs to be between 2035 and 2040, starting today, because it's the carbon budget that matters. So that's 10 to 15% reduction in our emissions every single year, starting now. If we fail this year, it's more next year. Paris 2 degrees C is not just about renewables and energy efficiency, much though they're really important. It means leaving about 80% of current fossil fuels in the ground, known ones today. That means no fracking, no looking for more fossil fuels, and full divestment from fossil fuels if we want to deliver on our Paris commitments. And that's just a start. Climate change, if you, if you interpret it through the scientific logic of carbon budgets, begs fundamental questions of our norms and our paradigms. We will require a Marshall-style transition in our supply technologies. We need to really squeeze very hard on our technologies and our appliances, our cars, our computers, to make sure they're the most efficient ones that we can buy. Not a labeling scheme, but you can only sell the most efficient, like the Japanese top runner program. We need profound shifts in the behaviors and practices of high emitters like me, and like no doubt some of you here. 
We need to reframe values, success, uh, um, and what we call progress. You can think about it now. When we really, what we really, or the people we appear to value in our society, always, or almost always have very high carbon footprints. We need to rethink that. We need to develop an economics that is fit for purpose, which we do not have at the moment. And we need to have serious consideration of intergenerational and intergenerational equity, people elsewhere in the world and future generations. And this needs to start now and be completed in about 30 years. So, you know, this is a, cha a huge challenge. We have a long way to go. So we've got these poor people here suffering from climate change, and yet we think it's re still think it's reasonable to have private yachts and large houses in Cheshire. Is that in, and they, they will have second homes and third homes as well and drive large cars. They are, they are not compatible. Do we really care about our future generations when we're thinking of having now massive LNG terminals around Europe with a new pipe network, gas pipe work in, in Europe? Do we really think it's reasonable to worry about our future generations when we're already in, investing lots and lots of money in space tourism and travel? I'm not completely against space tourism, provided the tickets are just singles. <laughs> because it's only the rich and the very high carbon that will go. Um, do we really honestly care about future, future species when we still think it's reasonable to drive around, in my case, 90 kilograms of flesh in 3,000 kilograms of car, even if it is a Tesla? You know, to travel, what, six kilometers to pick up 10 kilograms of, of groceries? Is that a reasonable thing to do in the 21st century? Do we think it's reasonable to try and live on our planet when we still merrily fly to conferences or to somewhere sunny on holiday regularly or weekend breaks? We have an ultimate, we have a choice between a real politic um, or a sustainable and real climate. And at the end of the day, the climate and nature and physics will always trump economics and the politics. So I'm going to conclude with the opening quote. Winning slowly is, the basic, is basically the same thing as losing outright. In the face of both triumphant denialism and predatory delay, trying to achieve climate action by doing the same things, the same old ways means defeat. It guarantees defeat. And then my quote is, we can do much better than that up north. <laughs> so, thank you for listening. Well done, uh, Kevin. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, very powerful. Certainly didn't pull any punches. Uh, but that's what we needed. We need to be challenged at the start of a day like today. I think by the end of today you can vote for your preferred candidates for one-way space travel. I think uh, <laughs> politicians will be at the front of that queue, I'm sure, as you uh, uh, think about that. Um, but I think we need to take you to Wigan. You need to come and see a real pie before you go back to Sweden, because uh, that, that, that wasn't one up, up there on the screen. But anyway, Kevin, thank you so much. That really has set the day up uh, perfectly and has laid out in pretty stark terms the, uh, the issues before us. So